Hello, everybody. I'm Ron Miscavige, and this is another episode of Life After Scientology. And let me get right into it. Uh, but before I do, let me take a little, take care of a little business. Uh, if you'd like to become a Patreon or contribute to the ongoingness of this program, and even with a one-time donation with PayPal, you can see how to do that in the description uh, on this link. I think I said the right words. I'm a little bit commu- computer illiterate at my age, you know. I haven't learned the things a third grade kid would learn. But anyway, that business out of the way, basically I'm saying if you want to help, I'd appreciate it very much. So listen, today we have a program that, boy, I'll tell you, I, I don't know exactly how to to introduce this without making it seem smaller than it is because it, it's a real big deal. And I have Karen Carol, Karen De La Courier on, which is your favorite guest and mine. Good morning, Karen. Hi, Ron. Hello, everybody. Can I just jump in and say that? Yes, you can. These events of the way the cult of Scientology has tried to crush, crush, give a knockout punch to Valerie Haney, a girl trying to just have her day in court. Ron and I reminisced on it. And we realized he was in 42 years. I was in 40, 82 years of living and breathing the cult. We realized that there's one word we can shrink it down to, that the cult exercises, executes power. So the show is on the word power. That's right. And it is, uh, this title was given not by us, but I think it was Time Magazine, The Cult of Greed and Power. There it is. Matter of fact, Karen has the page there for you. That's it. And that's the, the cult exploding. Of greed and Power. It's yeah. interesting, in 1991, yeah. that Time Magazine got it. They are a dominant, seeking, submissive, seeking, <laughs> seeking people to be subservient. They seek control, domination, power. So Ron and I wanted to kick this around and discuss um, why the cult chooses power above all else, above compassion, helpfulness benign uh, empathy uh, forgiveness no it only seeks power well let me give you a couple cents worth to start off with because Mm -hmm. you don't have to use power to actually control your people or keep them in the fold as they would say if you had a movement a religion uh, or anything, anything that you had a common purpose with people, if that purpose was high enough and beneficial to all, including the people who did it, and those people that if they affected with their movement, if you had a beneficial thing, you would expand like nobody's business. In the past, there have been religions that, even with their own faults, because they had a, a beneficial effect on people that they apply this to and a beneficial effect on the people who did it, they expanded and they didn't have to use power. Now, power is so insidious that many years ago, they used to talk about the ether in the universe, that the, the, the universe was filled with an ether. In Scientology, in the organization and in Anything to have to do with what they do, their technology, their organizational policies, that ether is filled with power. Everything they do is meant to control and use power to keep you under their thumb. That's my two cents worth. Well, all power isn't bad. Like you were you you were describing negative power and yeah. misuse of power. Yep. I mean, one could use power to benefit the many, just do great things for 
the civilization, for a city, for a country. But it's anti-power or just gross dominating power. <laughs> and just, just to cover, like, Ron, you and I lived in the sea organization for so long. The control over you, which is power over you, the time you wake up in the morning, how many hours you're permitted to sleep, even where you sleep, because you can be tossed and forced to not sleep in your bed, but go to pig's birthing. What time you eat, the allocation of allowing you only 15 minute meal break to eat. Yeah. It is down, down, where you report for muster three times a day, roll call. A senior hanging over your shoulder as to what you produced in the last hour, this kind of, it's suffocating control. And if you do not toe the line, punishments are horrendous. Horrendous. That, that's that's the whole point. Yeah. It, and it's called too gruesome. That's what they refer to it as. Now, you, it, it's been said in the past, well, the military has you fallout from musters and everything. Well, let me tell you something. I was in the United States Marine Corps. And it is true. There's a boot camp that you go through, which is pretty pretty tough but if you can last it out you you learn to be a disciplined person that was the biggest thing i got out of the marines and uh, it, i've applied that discipline my whole life to things that i've done and it's helped me but in the marine corps let's say you have a muster in the morning or you would report to your post in the morning and then all units would account for people who were there or people who weren't there the rest of the day you just did your job Nobody was pounding on you to get something done by a certain time. You were expected to do a job and you did it. Now, what was the punishment? Well, if you didn't do good, you didn't get promoted the next time. Mm. Okay. Uh, or maybe you were held in disfavor if you were always, you know, talking back to seniors and everything. And you, you were kind of ostracized by yourself. Nah, don't bother with him. He, he's a troublemaker. But that was it. That was it. You weren't forced to have an abortion if your wife got pregnant. You know, uh, you weren't forced to go in pig's birthing. The, the punishments are just so so many. I mean, why get into it? But we're getting into it. Go on, Karen. The power over you went right down to controlling your right to give birth. For 25 yeah. years, the cult controlled your right to procreate. And they coerced abortions for 25 years till the public till the internet boomed and facebook grew uh, just blogs and forums and, and the public outcry was so big that they knocked it off for pr reasons but they do it under the table anyway yeah you the CEO, you can't have a child but that's a power move we have the power to tell you whether you can have a baby or not do you see, yeah. it's, it's it, again, we're, we're isolating this word power. Ron, David Mayo, who was a very senior tech terminal, someone I love dearly, who has passed, he came, he used to audit L. Ron Howard. He came out one night into a starry sky. They was just chatting socially. This wasn't session confidential priest penitent, you're just chatting. And Hubbard said to David Mayo, I just have an incredible lust for power and money. You know, I heard that exact statement from a you friend did? of mine from those days who worked in the franchise office. Now, that was an office that later changed to the mission holders office yes but uh this friend of mine who was in a band i had in england at the time said that same same statement to me so i have a tendency to believe that that actually happened and it wasn't just somebody making it up what was the exact statement you heard that hubbard said tommy said to me one time he says you know ron he says hubbard once said i have this incredible lust for money and power that was the statement he made to me Oh, you just jogged my memory. 
the executive director international bill franks uh, went on recording he was doing shows with jeffrey podcasts and he was <laughs> they used to be invited up to hubbard's cabin on the apollo late at night hubbard would tell them nice stories a great storyteller and he told bill franks i've got this tremendous lust so he said it numerous times yeah. so, <laughs> so it's, it's it's on the podcast bill didn't this isn't wasn't hearsay like i was told by david mayo that he said that, that, that this is bill being told by so hubbard admitted to a lust the word we used was lust not desire yeah lust, a lust <clears throat> power that is right and David well, Scavage, your son, has continued this. And I will tell you, you use the statement, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Tell me how you view your son's seeking power and utilizing power. Well, and I'll say this again. I've said it on many of my podcasts and interviews. David not, wasn't always the way he is now. I, I must say that. And I know people will argue with me and they say, no, he was a son of a bitch from the word go. Well, you weren't there. I was there from the moment he was born. And I saw him with ter tremendous case of asthma. And it was really the bane of his existence as a little kid. I'm the one that took him to the doctors all the time to get a shot. And I would try to come up with different ways to handle him. And uh, I can remember when I took him in for a session with a guy by the name of Frank Ogle. Frank gave him a session. He never had a tremendously bad asthmatic attack for the rest of the time he was living at home until he joined the Sea Org. So that having happened led me to think this is something that I really want to get my whole, whole family involved in. Now, going back a little prior to that, as a little kid growing up, he had a tremendous sense of humor. He was smart as a whip. He was tough. I mean, we had a lot of good times together. He had achieved something that nobody else achieved with the winning of the tax exemption for the church in 1993. That gave him literally ultimate power. And the guy who said that, Lord Acton, he said, Back in the 1800s, an English uh, statesman, he was a member of the parliament. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I'm totally convinced this is what happened to David. So he has kept that mantra up and has used it with PIs following people. As I had PIs following me when I left the church getting paid $10,000 a week, reporting on my every doing from morning till night. And all I wanted to do was get on with life. Mm -hmm. I had my family taken away from me. That's another use of power. None of them speak to me. That Nobody has spoken to me. My daughters, their children, my great-grandchildren who I've never met from them since 2012. And that's how he has used power to handle people. So-called handle, but... The upshot of it is this. Had he not done that, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. <laughs> That's yeah. the kick around. In other words, I think the, the spiritual side of man is saying, hey, wait a minute. I'm not going to lay on the ground and let you kick me in the head. Maybe a little bit me more so because of my experience in the Marine Corps where you get a little tougher than you were before. Well, not a little bit, a lot tougher. So somebody does it to me, I say, you know what? I'm going to come after you. I'm going to do what I can, do anything to expose you for what you've done to people. So does it work? Didn't work with me. All the hate sites they have on me, Karen, I really don't care what they say. They can say what the hell ever they want. I'm going to continue doing this, continue doing the other programs you do here. So... You, you seem know, to you seem to think that power will work, 
But in the end, it'll come back and kick you in the head. They have tons of hate sites on me, but this gives me more friends. People write to me. I was the wife of the international president for 10 years. I bore him a son, Alexander Jench. Right. He died because of the cult's policy of disconnection. I was trained by Hubbard himself on the Apollo in the 1970s. I'm in your age group. I'm <laughs> Imagine if I was training in the 1970s. We're in 2020, right? 21 and, right now, yeah. <laughs> that uh, thing. Oh, 21, 2021. I was trained by Hubbard. I reached the highest class 12 CS. I don't think there's been more than seven or eight people that ever got to that rank. And they say, oh, she's a prostitute. <laughs> it just shows how well their technology works. Yeah. This is the result of them gouging money relentlessly, which then they use for power to crush. In fact, if you try to go after an enemy of the cult to crush them, to harm them, to make propaganda nonsense about them? You're a hero. I know. The cult want destruction. Nothing more than destruction of their enemies. Didn't LRH say, didn't LRH say, destroy them utterly? Destroy them utterly. Yeah. That's why I want to get back to Valerie. I, you know, I'll tell you, you read my mind because we get actually shortchanged her a little bit because what they're doing to her is actually hellacious. It is nothing that anybody would deserve. A, a person like her. All she wanted was some justice. And just for asking the judge yes. to re think about what he, he did, he now is going to put sanctions on her for $160,000. And she's going to have to submit to the church. Well, they asked for it, but the judge is a dope. Apparently, he's a fat, sluggish guy who who waddles along and he doesn't read and he was only appointed to be a judge in his 70s and he is he just can't separate apples from crawfish he's a so they know they've got a donkey judge yeah and and here's the thing here's a girl second generation born into it all no power of choice raised in the sea Org. she worked as david miscavige's personal steward for about three years. And she worked for Shelley Miscavige. And when she couldn't stand it anymore, she really hit a threshold where she could not live that life anymore. She, many of you know the story, but for all of those listening for the first time, there was a contractor at the base. They hire, they outsource certain things with contractors, she popped the trunk, jumped in and waited. And when he drove off, he drove two hours back to Los Angeles. She had escaped by hiding in the trunk, leaving behind everything she owned because she couldn't take, <laughs> it was just her body. So she fled with the clothes on her back. Can you imagine how desperate she must have been to crawl in the trunk with the possibility, you don't know this for sure, of suffocating? You don't know if there's air coming in that trunk. Yeah. yeah. So then when the guy arrived and she popped out of the trunk, he was like, oh, God. I don't <laughs> now, it's not a laughing matter, but let's face it, that guy must have thought, what the hell is this? Now, the cult of Scientology uses, <laughs> it uses cunning with its power, it uses cunning, cunning, crafty. And what they did was reel her back in to say, oh, just come in and do your, you know, do your final route out procedure. 
And she refused to go back to that dreaded place we call a gold base, in base. It's a horror. It's a place of horror. Yeah. It's a place where the dungeon, as behold, they have rituals, they beat each other, they they accuse each other of crime. It's a madhouse. Yeah. It's it's I would rather be in a psychiatric institution than be an in base. I'm telling you, my nightmare there was so bad and just so it's horrific. All the new mothers and fathers thinking of donating your kid to the Sea Org, letting them sign off. Just know we were there 82 years. In yeah. the cult. This is a horror, horror show. Once you get in, you, <laughs> you are bound. You are handcuffed. Yep. And you are dominated within an inch of your life. That's the way it is. Listen, I was there for 26 and a half years. It's like the Roach Motel. You can check in, but you can't check out. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just listen to some of these interviews I've done over the last almost two, yep. two and a half, maybe a little over two years now. Yep. They're yep. continually the same type of story. So these people, we don't gather together with tens and hundreds of people to say, hey, listen, here's what we need to say. That's baloney. They come on and I give them a platform to tell their story. You're right, Karen. No. It is a it's it's a madhouse. It li- literally. It is. It is. It's it's. It... <laughs> but Howard started it all, and Miss Cavage took it to a new level. Your son, he took it to a new level where their only modality is to exert power to punish you in an escalating fashion. Scientology does not believe in forgiveness, in empathy, in kindness, in compassion, or even to have a sit down and review what they consider you did that wasn't okay and communicate to see if you can learn a lesson. They only use force and increasing exponentially punishment yeah that's why we're saying power they have the power to do it because you cannot hit back if you do resist they will immediately threaten to take away by now all your friends and they will take away all your rights they will take away your family they will disconnect you and you will be shunned from everyone you ever knew But even more important is people believe their eternity is gone. I know. They believe it. (laughs) That's the kicker in this whole thing. You literally think that what you're doing is going to affect every man, woman, and child on this planet for eternity. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. I, I can't think of anything that would be as a, much of a bald-faced lie as that, Karen. Nothing. I've watched all this series. Of, it's just a fabulous series on escaping Mormonism. The FLDS escapes so similar to Scientology. <gasps> like a thief in the night, they have to... They, 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 these episodes are thrilling episodes. But there again... The only reason they were locked in is they believe yeah. their eternal life. <laughs> I know. Once you get that belief. So Scientology believes that increasing punishments will knock you into shape. And they exert power. This whole little segment you and I are doing is like, power, power. They have the power to do it because no one will fight back. So they call Valerie in after she escapes in the trunk of a car. She refuses to go back to in base. So they say, okay, okay. They so badly want to trick her into signing stuff. We'll do it at AOLA, a Los Angeles facility, a brick and mortar store here supposedly taking people to high, high states of OT. These very same OTs drop dead of heart attacks, get diabetes, 
get cancer, da, 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 da. even while even while on the level of OT <laughs> they develop cancer, they get tumors. Da, da. But Scientology breaks in money with promises of how you will be this, that, and the other. Valerie goes to AOLA. She gets, you see, they terrified of Valerie because she was, she yeah. knows every dirty little secret or any dark secret place of David Miscavige. You can't live with someone and be their personal steward and not know everything. I hope right. Valerie realizes she has power. She has power because she has knowledge. Knowledge. That, that's actually a, that's actually a, that's actually a true she statement, has Karen. Information. Yeah. She has data. Um. So they make her sign, and she's not thinking straight. She doesn't know the cunningness and craftiness. So she signs some papers, and in these papers it says that she'll only go to arbitration and not. Uh, no. Yeah. Not sue. But subsequent to that, Valerie totally. So she wasn't just someone who left, who still believe, who's part of the church. Many people leave and they, <laughs> they're still a Scientologist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're still taking services. They're still taking auditing. This Valerie departed everything, all of it. Now, Ron, this is a vital thing before we, this is the punch end of this show. This is so important. I, we just, I might have covered it briefly before, but it's such vital data that I want to really, really speak about it. The, the right of you belonging to a church belongs to you. You choose whether yes. you're under the church's domain or not. That is a very true statement, Karen. But I'll tell you this, a lot of people don't hold that truth to, in their own mind, though. Okay. That really is the problem here. Yeah, yeah. But let me give you a little story. I, I, okay, I, go ahead. Demonstrating yeah. it. There was a girl in Oklahoma. Oh, name, I got blank on names at my old age. Uh, there was a girl in Oklahoma who was having an affair with a local with the mayor and he was married and the church hierarchy demanded that on sunday she stand up at the pulpit and confess to the entire audience that she was having sexual intercourse with the married man mayor she refused because in those days well there's more and more having an affair these days is not considered a huge crime but in those days 60s 70s or whatever she would not get employed in middle america this is like ooh, this is this is sinful this is against thou shalt not commit adultery in yeah. the Bible. so she refused and the church hierarchy said <laughs> if you don't we will not only will we announce it to all the city in the audience but we've got two three other branches we're gonna broadcast it in every satellite church that you did this so she ran to a lawyer a very clever lawyer i'm actually going to put the link and the document to this story in comments I'd love you to pin it to the top because there's such a lesson to be learned from this. Oh, I, I will, yeah. The lawyer said to her, renounce all membership with the church. Put it in writing that you no longer are under their jurisdiction because you do not want to participate and you are completely done with their beliefs and, their, and belonging to them. 
Yeah, yeah. in other words, she, she quit. She you quit. Away, in other words. Yes, but you put it in writing. Or put it in front. I'll add the law office law office letter. There. So she resigned from them. And lo and behold, the hierarchy <laughs> announced her affair to one and all in all the churches. She sued because she was no longer under their jurisdiction. Hmm. She won a gigantic high six figure sum hmm. because she was not eligible for their punishment as no longer being a participant of any of it. So that turned out to be slanderous then, basically. As if she were still a member and only suspended or whatever, they could use their church. They could say, well, it's a church doctrine, First Amendment, blah, blah, blah. But she was not part of any of their First Amendment. She even announced them. She was gone. And still wow. they did that black libelous uh, giving, publishing her private. She won an incredible thing. And a lot of churches learn once you completely resign, you don't come under their First Amendment, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. So the lesson learned in our video today is you can't just slink away and hide under the radar and write to Karen de la Carriere. You can't do that. You have to actually put in writing, I do not choose anymore to be under your policies, your rules, your regulations. I am not a Scientologist is the magic word. I am no longer a Scientologist. Hmm. I am not under any, any law of yours. This is in writing. Graham Berry could do a cover letter or whatever. Once you resigned, I don't know if Valerie ever did that or not. I, I have no yeah. knowledge. But I'm telling all the audience here, write and resign in writing. They cannot then do thuggery on you as if you're one of, as if you're just a naughty wow. <laughs> dissident. Man, That's I'll tell you. That's the lesson learned from this video. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, the road to hell is paved with good advice. But you know what? I think that's good advice. It does not fall under that. I'll tell you. I think that is the lesson to be learned here. You just can't walk away and hide. And as you just said, you got to say, hey, I quit, man. Put it in writing. Let them know it. Publish it. Whatever you have to do. How can you lose? It's worth it. I, I think so. There was a girl who I won't name. But she fled and they were really pursuing her. And they circled her and they sent security guards and they they sent Office of Special Affair execs. And she said, I am not a Scientologist. She said the magical words. And do you know they just departed? Wow. They left her. They did not try to coax her back. The magical word is, I am not a, the magical phrase is, I am not a Scientologist. You have to let the cult know that you do not agree to any more power that they can have on you when you're not part of that belief anymore. You resign from it completely. I am not going to say another word about this because I think you've said it all. That's the lesson learned. And I'll tell you, thank you, Karen. This has been wonderful. And thank you, if you're watching this, heed her advice. I think that's <laughs> fabulous. I really do. I'm Ron Miscavige. This has been another Life After Scientology. Karen? Ron, I have another really good idea for the next show, but... This was good. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Ron. Your, yeah. your, your, Ron. We go back for. <laughs> we go yeah. back to Saint Hill. Many, many, many. I yes, in Saint Hill. Love and, yeah. an old, old friend. You are yeah. my, my dear, dear friend. Okay, guys, please do a Patreon. Send Ron a little donation. It all helps. He's 
84 years old. I'm going to be 80. I'm going to be 85 on January 19th. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and I'm still, January I'm still 19th. walking around and doing this. All right. Oh all right. wow, 85. Yeah. Ron, you're indestructible. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Karen. Thanks for appearing. Lots of love to you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. See you. Okay. See you on the next episode. Bye bye for now. Bye bye.